Hi, I'm Doug Carroll. Welcome to the session on fixed income securities. In this session, we're going to introduce you to the market for fixed income securities, uh, provide you a lot of detail on the characteristics of fixed income securities in general, as well as talk about the specific characteristics of different sectors of the fixed income market, issuers, investors, and a wide variety of concepts related to the analysis and valuation of those securities. So let's begin. Now, first off, it might be a good idea to, to talk about what a fixed income security is uh, to give you a, a sense of the, the general characteristics of these types of securities, as well as who, who creates them and why they're created. Well, in general, a fixed income security is any debt security or debt obligation. We'll talk about that in more detail in just a few moments. And they're created by issuers, that is entities that are borrowing money by issuing these securities. And these issuers could be corporations, governments, government agencies. And when we talk about governments, governments from a wide variety of levels, from national or federal governments to provincial or state governments, all the way down to, to local governments and administrative districts. So debt securities have been issued for uh, many, many centuries by a wide variety of different sorts of entities. And the um, markets for these securities are extremely large. In fact, the Fixed income securities markets are a multiple of the equity markets. So that while equity markets oftentimes are uh, getting more cover coverage in the popular press or financial news, uh, in reality, the, the, the central uh, gravity of the securities markets is the fixed income markets itself. In fact, if you look at the size of the fixed income markets relative to economic activity, uh, which is oftentimes quantified by real GDP, Fixed income markets are currently north of $100 trillion in value at current market prices. And you'll note that's a multiple of worldwide uh, gross domestic product. And um, as far as the market sectors, I, I gave you an indication of that when we were talking before about the, the, the issuers of these securities. But when people break the, the, the markets down into segments, they typically distinguish between government issuers, government agency issuers, private borrowers, mostly corporations, as well as those lower levels of governments we talked about previously. And one item I've sort of skipped over on this first page here is what's fixed about a fixed income security? Because one sort of fundamental issue you need to get a grasp of is a handle on the specific terminology of the business, what's oftentimes referred to as jargon. And especially for people new to the markets, that jargon is one of the, the stumbling blocks. So we'll not answer the question right now, but just propose a number of alternatives and we'll, we'll uncover the answer as we go forward. But when um, uh, people think about fixed income securities in response to what's fixed about a fixed income security, now, these are terms that we'll go over in more detail in subsequent slides, but many people think it's, oh, probably the, uh, the par value, which we'll define in detail later, but it's representative of the amount of money borrowed. But clearly, par value is not necessarily fixed uh, because there are securities where the par value will be changed with the passage of time, uh, things like inflation-adjusted or treasury inflation-protected securities or the, the par value or the, the, um, uh, the amount of money uh, that the issuer has to repay uh, might be affected by things like the conversion value of the security um, uh, or convertible securities. So the ultimate maturity value uh, might be defined as, as the greater of either the uh, par value of the securities or the value of the, the securities the, the bond is convertible into. Now, Many people guess, well, then uh, what's fixed would be the uh, maturity of the security. Well, uh, most bonds have a maturity date, but in fact, many bonds don't have a maturity date. There are such things as perpetual securities that don't mature at all. And even bonds that do have a maturity date, that maturity date might not be, at least in terms of the retirement of the debt, that might not be fixed either because some securities are extendable. The maturity might be put off by the issuer. Some maturity is going to be shortened by the issuer calling the bond or bondholders putting the bond back to the issuer. So while most bonds have a fixed maturity date, that date is oftentimes uncertain. Well, many people might think that, well, then it's the coupon rate that's fixed. 
because many people will view the coupon as the income one gets from holding a fixed income security. And clearly many bonds have fixed coupon rates, but there are many fixed income securities that don't have fixed rates. There's zero coupon securities. Now, you might say, well, the coupon's fixed at zero, and I wouldn't argue that, but the, the point is there is no coupon. But there are floating rate or adjustable rate instruments where the coupon will reset at, uh, at, at identified frequencies. Or there are what are known as split rate or step up coupons where the coupon is going to change according to some schedule. So while most bonds have fixed coupons, again, there are many securities that don't have fixed coupons or, or at least not a constant coupon. And many people even think that it's the rate of return that is fixed on a fixed income security. And while um, that might not be a surprising interpretation that the rate of return is fixed because most basic books on the subject of fixed income securities will define the yield to maturity as the rate of return an investor will earn if they buy a bond and hold it all the way to maturity. But that's a, a very gross mis-explanation of what yield to maturity is. And even a, a few seconds of thought would have to disabuse you of the idea that that could possibly be true. Because given that most bonds do pay coupons, whether they're fixed or not, as we talked about before, clearly your rate of return to maturity will be heavily influenced by the reinvestment rate. That is the rate at which you're reinvesting all those coupons received over the life of the security. And if you can't know the reinvestment rate with certainty, how could you possibly know the rate of return to maturity? So while many people will mistakenly think it's one or a number of those things that are fixed, it turns out that it's not necessarily any of those. But we'll ultimately come back to answering that question after we've gone through an explanation of these and other bond features in a bit more detail. So uh, we talked about the various sectors. Let's look at them a, a little bit more closely. So if we look at the, the, the markets for fixed income securities, I gave you a quote of the approximate size anyway, and clearly that varies over time. And while I cited the fact that fixed income markets are typically much larger than the equity markets, again, that's not a fixed ratio or relationship either. But in most of the developed economies, the, the, the public market for fixed income securities is probably anywhere from two to four times the size of the equity market in that same financial market. Now, with regard to the market segments, you see a, a, a listing of the sectors. And we'll talk about all of those sectors over the course of the session. And for most individual financial markets anyway, that's country markets, typically the government bond market is the largest of any market sector in a particular uh, uh, financial, uh, that's national financial market. But other significant sectors are the corporate bond market. In, in many uh, markets, the corporate bond market will be uh, a significant feature, uh, half to almost equal to the size of the government securities market, in some cases even larger. There's also markets for what are sometimes in the aggregate called structured securities because unlike the other obligations which represent the borrowing of a single issuer, these structured securities usually represent packages of, of, of credit instruments. Could be mortgages, could be credit card receivables, could be auto loans or a variety of other things. Uh, but those are mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, and uh, collateralized debt obligations. Money markets are the markets for short dated debt securities of any issuer, generally defined as securities having a year or less to maturity from the date of issuance. And then there's also other levels of government or government associated issuers. That is the government agencies and the local or regional governments we talked about previously. And a detailed explanation of the history of the bond market is clearly beyond the scope of, of, of what we can discuss in this session, but just to give you a hint of it, the, uh, the, the tradition has it at least that the bond markets have evolved from actually annuities created by uh, the Italian city-states in the Renaissance. Uh, the city-states being at least nominally democracies where the upper middle classes and the well-to-do at least had some say in the, in the form of government. Well, as we're, we're seeing in today's environment, of course, 
democracies have a hard time not spending a lot of money to, to, to support the population and possibly buy votes. But in any event, the Italian city-state democracies running into financial difficulties would borrow money from their citizens. Sometimes it was a forced borrowing. But it wasn't just a seizure. The government would promise to pay interest on that annuity in perpetuity. And those claims, the annuities held by the Italian families, could actually be traded amongst one another. So that's actually, believe it or not, the, the first beginnings of the trading in fixed income type instruments that the bond market we see today evolved from.